And this is the House Health Care Committee. It's Thursday, February 10th. It's about 1041. And we are continuing with the opportunity to uh, field questions from committee members uh, with uh, representatives from the Green Mountain Care Board, who we heard earlier in the morning uh, in a separate Zoom presentation that is available and is available on our committee webpage uh, around hospital sustainability. It was, uh, it seemed to me that it, if we were able to do this, uh, that there might be an opportunity for our committee uh, to ask more questions and to get more information about the issues of hospital sustainability and some, some of the underlying issues, which we honestly have taken less testimony on than our counterparts in the Senate to this point they will bring a bill to us after crossover that will build on some of this. Uh, but today, I uh, appreciate your flexibility. I'm going to suggest that, uh, I mean, I don't know how, what questions we'll have or how long this will go, but I'm going to suggest that we go, we, we think about going at the outside to 1130 uh, and maybe, and we'll see how we're going in the meantime, uh, uh, but appreciate your flexibility. So, um, I'm going to turn to Representative Houghton, and I don't know if that's a, on behalf of someone in the room or yourself, but go ahead. Actually, for myself this time. Great. <laughs> and then Representative Donahue has a question. Okay. Um, for, for those, uh, for the Green Mountain Care Board, I tend to raise a hand for those of us in the room oh. since you can't always see everyone. So, yeah. So, my question is this, and, and I was, um, Talking, we were, two of us were talking in the hallway about the presentation, which was wonderful. And personally, I find this next stage really exciting. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, really, I, I give you all a lot of credit, and I appreciate the thoughtfulness you've put into this. And really, um, Professor Holmes' comments on how hard change is and understanding that we will be sure to keep that in our minds as we work with stakeholders throughout this whole process. One of the most exciting pieces for me would be the community aspect of this. And I'm just curious what the conversations have been or will be around, when you say community outreach, how does that work? What parties are included? how, um, you know, not just specific healthcare providers, but are there other types of stakeholders that you see at the table? Well, I'll start and uh, just jump in if uh, um, I get sidetracked here, but um, the, the full process hasn't de been defined yet, but all parties need to be at the table. So um, there has to be, um, at the same time that there's conversations with the, the medical community in a given health service area, there has to be conversations with um, the community itself. It has to be a patient-centered approach, um, the conversation, and one where everybody feels like it's um, best for them. So it, it uh, can't just be closed door meetings in the CEO's office at the uh, local hospital, that won't work. Jess, you wanna jump in? Yeah, and I was just gonna say, I mean, I think, you know, we have to start with hospitals and tr their trustees who are representative of their community to be sure, and walk through some of the data that we've observed on prices and on costs and on volumes and really help, you know, some of, uh, you know, them help us understand what we're seeing and help us think about what we're seeing and observing around some of the high cost areas. We have to then expand it, these conversations to the entire, you know, care continuum, providers in the community, independent providers in the community, uh, folks that are, you know, providing mental health services. I mean, if we really want to think about how we can deliver essential services and care better to our communities, everybody has to be at the table, as Kevin said, local businesses who are paying for you know, um, effectively the premiums that are associated with those commercial prices, they have to be at the table too. I mean, I think we have to really start to dig into the data, get everybody involved in understanding what we've observed, what we've seen. Some of that, there was a table in there. Uh, I, let me see if I can figure out what slide it was. Um, 
I don't have it in front of me. I do, but I'm trying to flip through it. It's slide 16 and slide 17. You know, some of those slides really reveal some interesting um, data around the costs of some of our smallest hospitals, um, high fixed costs, low volumes in those areas. And so they're translating into higher prices. Uh, that are being faced by the by the patients in those communities, and so maybe compromising access. So we have to have those kinds of conversations. We have to share that data, um, and we have to understand where are there gaps in care. So there are communities that don't have enough primary care. There are communities that don't have access to mental health services. What can we be doing to ensure that access? So those are the types of conversations that we have to have at the community level with everybody involved and everybody at the table. And can I Thank just add? Quickly, go ahead, Lori. Did you want to say one more thing, Representative oh, Houghton? I'm sorry. I thought it was echoing, but someone, no, go ahead. I'll follow up after <laughs> no, you. I'll be very, I will be very brief, but um, I thought of this as we were presenting earlier. Um, we we are looking at equity as well. And I, I think it does, your, your question, it, I think is, we need to look at the entire community and where are those gaps in care. And there's there's all all of the equity. I don't want to start ticking them off, but in particular as it relates to rurality, and that is a focus of our federal partners as well. Equity of, of all sorts, but in particular rurality. Thank you. And if I can just um, make follow up, I sure. I liked when um, uh, someone mentioned social determinants of health. And what I'd like to suggest, and I'm sure you're already thinking about this, is it's not just the healthcare providers. So can we have, you know, the family centers involved in the conversations? Can we have representatives of the schools involved in the conversations? You know, there's a lot of healthcare that happens within our schools. And there's a lot of money for mental health flowing through our schools. And we seem to not bring them into the conversations. How about food shelves? Um, you know, I, I, if, if we're going to reimagine the system, which is kind of what we're doing here, it needs to not just be healthcare providers, but also the other providers in the community that make up the whole person. So that would just be my comment. And if I can just add one more, <laughs> sorry, then I'll stop. Just to make sure that we're not relying on the healthcare providers to, um, provide contacts in the community for other people who should be at the table, but that we're going to other leaders in the community to say, these are the conversations we're going to be having, who should be at the table, and how do we best draw in the community to watch these conversations and provide feedback in other ways, such as surveys or you know, feedback to the Green Mountain Care Board. I, you are all extremely transparent, but I think a lot of the Vermonters don't understand how to gain access to you and how to follow what you do and be involved in that transparency. So I just would hope you keep all that in mind. Thank you. I just want to say, I think that's brilliant. And I think it's important that we have, you know, folks who are delivering social services be a part of the table. I love the idea of bringing schools in. And um, I think what we need to do, part of the ask is to identify facilitators who can help us think through how these conversations can be done effectively, building consensus and thinking about who needs to be at the table and what information do they need to make thoughtful decisions. So that's part of where we need some expertise here. Right. Uh, yeah, so I, I have uh, two questions. Um, first of all, uh, it, it was sort of touched on on that timeline slide, but, um, but I need some help understanding the connection between uh, First of all, uh, our all payer model, which is premised on, on needing an ACO because that's the brings in the Medicare, which in Vermont right now is one ACO, the, the one care. So how does one care um, through that <laughs> series of connections play into what you're presenting here? So one care, I think uh, will always have a role mainly because they have such uh, close ties to uh, the UVM network. And so I think that uh, care coordination and data analytics, um, they'll continue to provide that and it'll be a necessary piece of what would be done. And they could have a role outside of the network as well, as long as they're delivering the type of um, 
package to each local health service area that is providing them with the, the right analytics, the information, and the care coordination. So as it fits into um, the model, the model doesn't call out One Care Vermont. The model that we're currently under talks about having a flow through accountable care organizations. The federal government had always envisioned that there would be um, multiple accountable care organizations. And if you remember the history in Vermont, at one point there were three different uh, groups that were trying to set up uh, an accountable care organization. Um, there was one that was being worked on by the FQHCs, um, one which became One Care, and the other was the um, VCO, the, the uh, and I think the VCO envisioned that they would be the, the one that would bring everybody together and merged into one, but um, the one that succeeded in being able to set themselves up was One Care Vermont because they had the resources of Dartmouth and UVM behind them. And the federal government usually asks um, in, in meetings, do you think that um, it's okay to only have one? And it's kind of a mixed answer because what I say is it would cost a lot of money to set up a second administration and set of IT infrastructure to have a competing ACO. Not that I'm opposed to that because I actually like competition and I think competition keeps everybody honest, but um, I'm not sure that it's bad that we don't have competing ACOs right now. Um, my gut still would be happier if there were, was competition in that market, but we don't. So that's how the money flows under the current all-payer model agreement. Um, why we need the federal government's participation um, to really make global payments work is um, Medicare, even though it's um, not the largest percentage of the population, it's the, the largest consumer of healthcare. And when you talk to hospitals, that's where um, the majority of the dollars are flowing. So um, what we're hoping, and there's been really good success with a model in Pennsylvania that involves global budgets. And that built upon success of a model that had been in place in Maryland. So, um, we're not uh, going to unknown territory here. And in fact, the, the, our counterparts in Washington are very excited about what's happening in Pennsylvania. And I think that uh, they would be very welcoming to a model that moved further in that direction. And so I, I would hate to see us go on our own so that that big piece of the pie, Medicare, wasn't part of the global payment because I think it's essential for the success of that. So maybe I'll just add out a little bit here. I think that the next federal agreement, the hope is that it really moves us much farther away from fee for service, which we've shown is it, we know is problematic towards more of this value-based payment, ideally global payments. And, and as Kevin said, we need to make sure that the next federal agreement has Medicare at the table. Um, in those global payment models. So without, you know, we don't want to speak for the other all-payer model signatories or the next federal agreement signatories, but I think the board would want to incorporate a lot of the learnings that we've seen here in our sustainability analysis into the proposal for the next model. And the hope is that the work we're talking to you about today is going to help communities get ready for the changes that are coming their way, contribute to the planning efforts so that they can be incorporated in the next all-payer model proposal or the next federal agreement um, due at the end of this year. And I, I just would say, you know, I appreciate Kevin's comments. Um, this, this work can happen with or without an ACO. It's agnostic to an ACO. It's about changing the payment system, and it's about ensuring that the system itself is, e is efficient and is maximizing quality access and minimizing costs. That's, that's the goal here. So just I also want to uh, just make clear that we're just one signer on the agreement and that we're not driving the negotiations with the federal government that the um, Agency of Human Services is. And I don't want um, them to think that we're out in front and 
trying to uh, dominate this conversation. What we're trying to find out is if this is a viable path for the future of healthcare reform in Vermont. And so we're working with them. And I, I, I worry that sometimes um, people might think that we've taken control of the conductorship of the uh, train and that uh, we're doing this on our own. And I, d I don't want that to uh, that message to be out there. Um, yeah, I, I guess I have to articulate my question um, better because I got sort of lost um, in, in, I'm just trying to, the, the concept of a global budget, um, I guess the question is, does that go through, uh, does that go through an accountable care organization if it's, if it's keeping uh, Medicare at the table because Medicare depends on that or uh, would the, would the, where does the money, does the money flow change? Does it not go through accountable care organizations or if it doesn't, does that lose Medicare? So um, the there's, a, there's a number of different possibilities that it, where, how it could flow. So it could flow through state government. Um, these are all things that would have to be negotiated with the federal government and what they would feel comfortable with. Um, where they have had um, success with global um, uh, payments, um, what is in their minds has made it work. So for example, in Pennsylvania is that they set up a, a regulatory system similar to what we have in Vermont. Um, so if you're doing um, a global payment model, rather than um, going through the, the different uh, line items on a, a hospital's uh, budget, what the, the regulatory um, work that would be done, hopefully by us at the Green Mountain Care Board would be um, reconciling that bigger global payment and making sure that the quality of care and the access to care is there in every area of the state, because then the, the, the shift is more away from, are you doing everything right to, to keep your hospital financially afloat to, are you doing everything right to treat the uh, patient at the right time in the right place with the right care? And, and so, um, you know, those are details that have not been been worked through, and that's part of what this process would in, would involve. So my my second question is because, of course, I think all of us worry about um, you know I, there just seems to be a lot of duplicate care management and duplicate analytics. So when you reference, well, there's a role for that analytics, but but you know analytics is taking place different places. When when we start talking about this overall where are our resources and where are our gaps on all of the different fronts in terms of uh, care, uh, potential centers of excellence, workforce issues. Um, it seems like we already have the structure to identify, we already have the tool there, but we haven't been using it in terms of the health resource allocation plan. That's that was that's its intended function. Um, so I'm a little un, unclear about um, what new things we're thinking of creating versus existing tools. Whether it's analytics going on in you know <clears throat> CARES role versus Green Mountain Care Board, and um, just seems like there's a lot of pieces out there. Yeah. Looks like uh, Susan would like to weigh in. Just as a, a, a representative Donahue, you are asking the questions and I know representative Lippert, Lipp, Chair Lippert is going to have uh, Donna Kinzer or have her present to you. I don't wanna assume, but you did mention that earlier. These are the exact questions that she asked um, that she did for the health, Res health reform oversight committee this summer. And I believe that that would um, provide a starting point to, to some of those questions that you have, because I think if if we were to answer all the in, into those granular details at this point, I think you'll see from her presentation that's exactly what she was setting up. Big picture, <clears throat> she's looking at global payments as a as a solution to a lot of the things we're seeing in Vermont and getting more folks moved over to value based care. 
but she did address the data gaps as well. And I'm happy to share that with, share her presentation with Claire, if that would be helpful. Sure, that'd be great. I will, I will hold my question for when we get there. <laughs> okay, that's great. That's great. Okay, um, so let's move on. Uh, Representative Black, uh, Representative Houghton, uh, I think, did, did I see Representative Peterson his hand up at one point? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, time ago. So my hand is for Representative Peterson and Representative Page. Okay, and okay. I want to weigh in with some questions myself as well. So well, let's go first to represent Black, then Representative Peterson, then Representative Page, and then me. Thank you. Um, so I, I have a comment. I also have a question about something that um, I had heard in 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago, whenever it was. Um, much to Representative Donahue and Rep Representative Houghton's point, I do hope that as we're looking at moving towards sort of global budgets, um, that we're taking into account services that are being provided currently that may not be in the most efficient manner that they could be within the system that they are now. And that, you know, we're not, we're not just turning into a global budget and asking you to be all things to everyone for every service. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, independent ambulatory care centers, um, uh, primary care. And we, we know that, that community-based services are oftentimes much less expensive to provide with the community and also oftentimes better quality. Um, so, you know, I hope we'll be looking at that sort of thing. That was my one comment. The other thing was, and I think Professor Holmes, you had mentioned this um, as regarding the analytics and the data. You had said, you know, we need to find out what data should we be collecting? What, what quality measures should we be collecting? And I'm thinking about the fact that we've been on the all payer model now for almost five years. What have we learned about the data that we've been collecting um, for quality value-based payments in that model that we could be moving forward and where are our gaps and what are, what are we missing that we haven't learned yet, I guess, is my question. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Elena, and then I'll add. Sure. No, I was just going to say, I think um, it's important to remember that the all peer model measures are not hospital specific measures. So that's the that's the first thing. And, and they're much more focused to kind of some goals under the agreement. I think the work um, that we're currently performing with BPQHC and the hospitals will allow us to have an understanding of all of the different quality metrics that hospitals are or are not participating in reporting. Right. So there are a lot of programs that require them to report. Um, you know, on certain criteria, but it's not uniform across hospitals. So once we have that, I think we'll have a better understanding of where the gaps are, um, but that deliverable won't be prepared until later this summer as well. And I guess I would just add to that with some of the, some of the things that we're trying to explore with understanding hospital quality specifically is that there are data that are collected at the hospital level, but for very, for many small hospitals, there are such low numbers that the data isn't collected. And so we're trying to identify what are quality metrics that can be specifically used for small rural hospitals that have low volumes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's turn to Representative Peterson and Representative Page. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my question. Uh, let's see, I, I'm trying to do three things here and kind of lost track. The, I've heard for a year and a month about uh, switching from um, pay for service, fee for service, to fee for value, fee for health. And I guess I'm, I'm still not understanding um, what that really means in terms of its impact on if there's any at all on the 
service given to patients. Um, I, I keep hearing about it, and, and it's one of the recommendations that we do it. It was a recommendation last year, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, tr I'm, I'm struggling with um, what, what it means, first of all. And then we, I saw a slide here, and we've been talking about um, low volume in some hospitals. And I'm wondering if it means that we are going to determine the value of the hospital to be a certain amount because of where it is, shower money on it, and not worry about the low volume. And, and I'm wondering if that's what it is or if it's something different than that. So I'll start with your first question, uh, Representative Peterson. Um, what is a move from um, volume to value? And um, what that move is, is that there's a lot of uh, empirical uh, data and you may even want to invite in um, Elliot Fisher from Dartmouth. Uh, he and others at Dartmouth did an analysis that uh, the, a quick sum would be that just because you have um, more care doesn't result in better outcomes. So um, you need to have the right care. And um, what you have now is a, a perversion of um, the care that's delivered in the system. So for example, if a hospital's big ticket items are on ortho procedures, another procedure um, might be put by the wayside. And most recently I heard the story of a Vermonter who had a positive uh, test from a Cologuard that indicated that there could possibly be cancer. And- um, Colon cancer. Colon cancer, yeah, and the the problem was that uh, there wasn't um, available procedure room space because um, the ortho surgeons were given priority for that space and had already uh, booked it. So it just it if you're giving a um, a hospital lump sum of money, what you're expecting them to do is to give people the right care at the right time. You don't defer somebody that could have cancer. You don't have them wait. In fact, that's one of the problems that we have right now um, in patients presenting themselves at uh, hospitals for the last few months is because all non-emergent care was shut down during the early stages of the pandemic. People weren't getting the screenings that they should have gotten, the, the, the mammographies, the colonoscopies. And, and so when they show up, what they have is something that has progressed to a further point on, on the uh, continuum and they need a higher level of care. So patients that are going in the hospital right now are more acute than they were pre-pandemic. And that's exactly the wrong thing. So what you wanna do is be able to have each local community set up a system where, um, so for example, you can, you can pick um, high blood pressure or diabetes or, or any one of the number of uh, chronic illnesses. And, and Representative Peterson, the, the, the chronic illnesses, even though it's 20% you know, of the population, it's 80% of what we're spending on healthcare. And so if you can prevent somebody and help them eat better, get better physical activity um, when they're diagnosed with pre-diabetes, and, and get them on a, a, a really a regimen that will keep them healthy, then they don't need to go in and, for an amputation or um, lose eyesight and things like that. So what you're trying to do and what the, the whole first movement was away from volume because volume is about keeping the cash register ringing at the, the hospital. And too often, even though I don't think a lot of it is conscious in that somebody is thinking we just need to uh, bring in the dollars off of this. But what they're thinking is we've got to keep our doors open so that we provide all care to the community. So we need to have the higher pay for the, the surgeons who are um, bringing in the dollars to the hospital. And so that's the perversions in a fee for service world. And we want to move to a world where um, people 
are treated holistically. And, um, you know, that's, that's really the move. And I probably haven't really answered that first part of your question, have I, Art? Oh, you, 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 you have answered a lot of it, Kevin. Um, I, I, in my experience, just one guy's experience, I, I, it seems like the physicians I've seen have always talked about weight, talked about what you can eat, talked about these things. I mean, unless you're going to be in the person's house and then slapping his hand every time he eats the wrong thing, I, I don't know how you get at those things. Uh, don't get me wrong, they're very important, but um, I, I, I struggle with what we're trying to get at. I, I, frankly, I don't, I don't know if it's doable. I, I really don't. I mean, but, uh, value. What, what do you value your health? The individual has to value his health. And, and I don't know that a hospital, but, but my overarching question at this point, beyond that, and it's an easy one, I, not an easy one, but it's fundamental. What role do we play as legislators in this? Okay. In other words, you, if, if that's the way you want to do things, why don't you do it? I guess I started to be blunt, but I'm just, what's stopping you from doing this now? So um, just as you passed Act 113, which um, set up the uh, framework um, for um, regulating the all-payer model agreement, um, this isn't a, um, a Lone Ranger effort by the Green Mountain Care Board. This has to be um, an all-in effort um, from government as well that, um, so in other words, you would have to be supportive of a, a global payment model through Medicaid. Um, DIVA is a, a, a huge program. And uh, so without the legislature support and commitment to it, it would be almost pointless for us to try to do it on our own. And I don't think we could do it on our own. So these payments would come in a different form that they than they than they come now. Is that what you're saying, or in different values and in different places? Yeah, rather than sending out a bill for each single procedure that occurs, um, it, it gets rid of a lot of that uh, um, administrative nightmare um, following the dollars. And Elaine, I see you you popped up, so why don't you jump in? Yeah, no, I, I think you can think about it in terms of an allowance. So the hospital doesn't have to earn its dollars by seeing patients, but you give them a lump sum and say, here's your lump sum. You have to provide care for this population. It gives hospitals more flexibility to treat patients in different ways than they are currently right now. So you can hire a health coach. You know, Some people that might not work for it. Other people might find it useful to check in with a health coach to, as they make these transitions. You can hire mental health providers right in your hospital. You know, There's some things that are not currently reimbursed under the fee-for-service system that still provide value to patients and help them make healthier choices or help them identify health needs sooner. Um, you know, Those are the kinds of investments that hospitals can make when they have this global budget and they can plan to provide care for a population rather than just waiting to see who comes in the door. Um, and so I think that's, those are the kinds of dynamics we're trying to change, but we don't, we're not in the business, we're not advocating for managing what providers are doing. That is not what this is. I think what we're doing is saying, hey, providers can't provide the best care to patients when they have to think about how they're gonna keep the lights on. How do we flip those incentives so providers don't have to worry about that and they can focus on what they wanna focus on, which is keeping people healthy. Maybe I could just add to that a little bit. I think right now the, the service lines at hospitals are optimized for fee-for-service revenue. So, uh, you know- Jessica, gonna... there's something you're hitting your microphone. It's, there's a loud, scratchy <laughs> sound. Yeah, that, that Sorry. Sound very horrible sounds. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so they're, ma you know, the service lines are, are maximizing fee for service revenue. So they're investing in those services that have the highest margins. And, you know, and that makes a lot of sense. The hospitals are not to blame here. They are reacting exactly to the incentives that the fee for service model has created. But that means that they're going to be, you know, reliant, for example, on orthopedic surgeries, even if they can't meet the minimum volume thresholds that we know are out there for quality, they're going to want to rely on that because orthopedics has a high margin. And when they face financial distress, 
they're going to shed their least profitable essential services that are things like primary care and mental health because those are low margins. So they're doing what they need to do to keep the lights on in the, in the payment world that they live in, right? And so their orthopedic surgeries where they have high margin are actually reimbursing or making sure that they have enough reimbursements to keep the birthing centers open that are low margin, right? Because that's, that's, just, that's how the fee-for-service system works. If we move to a global payment model, as Elena said, and there's a, as a fixed payment that's given to hospitals, what you're going to see and what we hope and what's starting to see in, in states like Pennsylvania and other places is that there's a reallocation of resources towards the highest value care because now the hospitals have a sustainable flow of dollars coming in and they can re reallocate. And you know, you're going to see more investment in primary care, mental health, care coordination, social services, things like that, because that's where the highest return on investment is and they don't have to rely on just high margin volumes to keep the lights on. Okay, good morning. Could you repeat? Or a combination thereof. And, and believe me, I'm just trying to understand. Can you repeat the first part of your question, Art? Because we couldn't hear it. Uh, the global payments that, that are given to the hospitals, they come from uh, Fed money, state money, or a combination of, of both? How, how does that dynamic work? And then what do we do to measure um, the success of this? So it would be a combination of both federal and state because the federal government um, runs the Medicare program. And again, that's the biggest chunk of dollars that are, are going to flow through the hospitals. State runs the Medicaid program. That's another huge chunk. And ideally, you would be able to um, tie in commercial payers, but these are all things that would have to be worked out and uh, figured out. But um, there could be um, a flow of funds that um, put the monies together before they were distributed, or there could be a flow of funds that just went directly from um, the individual payers to the, uh, the uh, hospitals. And do you think this will cost less, Kevin? Do you think it will be more efficient doing it this way than fee for service? I guess that's why we're doing it, or one of the reasons. Not the primary, but one of them. Yeah, I do think it would be more efficient. I think that uh, it takes some of the efficiencies, uh, um, the inefficiencies out of the, the current system. And so um, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't think that we could get um, better outcomes. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to turn to Representative Page, and uh, I, it looks like we might have questions that go beyond 11.30. We'll see how we do. Representative Page? Yes, Representative uh, thank Gordis. you. Sir. Just a couple of questions. Um, this global payment system, um, it's going to be able to, the hospitals are going to be able to reallocate uh, some of their services, I guess, funds to other services. Will hospitals lose current services that are available and those services, will they go elsewhere as a result of this? That's, that's a concern of mine. And then the other issue is, okay, we implement this and we find out it isn't working. Do we have a backup plan? Are there backup plans to... Um, make corrections. As uh, Chair Lippert mentioned earlier, flexibility, that's the key, I think, to everything. Is um, the Green Mountain Care Board flexible um, to make necessary changes as time goes on to fix this? I think without flexibility, it would be doomed for failure. So you would need to have flexibility because you're going to see that populations will move and um, there's going to be other uh, changes in demographics that occur. So flexibility is important. As to the first question, um, say, for example, where you are, Representative uh, Page, um, you're not close to anybody else. So it would be pretty hard for, for your hospital to shed services and still make sure that people in, in that area of Vermont are getting uh, proper care. There could be shared services in hospitals that are closer together, and, and that would make a lot of sense. So, for example, one of the um, uh, strategies that came out of the Springfield uh, bankruptcy 
is a hope that uh, there could be an alliance with Dartmouth. And because of what um, took place um, in New Hampshire, Dartmouth is in the process of acquiring um, the Catholic hospitals out of uh, Manchester in, in Southern New Hampshire, which is where all the population is, the, the Granite uh, hospitals. And um, that's still, I believe, under the um, um, attorney general's office there that makes decisions on um, whether or not uh, a hospital can acquire another entity. And so they didn't, uh, they didn't wanna take on anything else other than that as they're going through this antitrust scrutiny in their own state. But that um, strategy would have been to have one CEO, one CFO, and one CNO. Um, in other words, one set of uh, leadership for three hospitals. It would have been Springfield, Mount Escutney, and Valley Regional in Claremont, New Hampshire. And in that particular scenario, the hospitals would decide between themselves um, who could deliver the services best. And because there was close proximity, that, that could happen. Um, if you live where you live, that couldn't happen because you just don't have that, uh, that uh, geography that would allow that to occur. So each area of the state is unique and would be different. Right. And then I guess my final question is my concern also, along with uh, Representative uh, uh, Houghton, is the fact that uh, uh, the communities that they participate. I, I think that might be very difficult to get all of our communities to participate. And I, I, hope, I hope that's something that can be done. Yeah, this is not something that's going to be easy. So thank you. Uh, so uh, th thank you, Representative Page. I want to just throw in a question here, and um, or a comment and a question that this will involve some kinds of change, uh, but there's not a plan. There's not a plan behind a black curtain somewhere that says this is this is this is the plan. And I think that that's. I think there's a sense of there can be a sense of apprehension and fear that. Uh, Anytime you mention anything specific, and everyone thinks about their own their own situation uh, in terms of change, like, well, what what am I going to have to do differently? What are we going to what's going to be different here? And I think uh, at least my my I'm taking at face value that there is not a there 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 is a there is a necessary based on the dynamics and the data that we see there is a necessary change because change will happen. Change is going to happen regardless. And I think that's the point I want to make. The market, as what you said, there will be, there will be changes, but they may not be the changes that we want. Uh, changes will come because some, some things will not be viable. Uh, and, so, and we already see changes happening uh, when hospitals are shedding a pediatric care or hospitals are shedding uh, other kinds of care, or we know that there's not sufficient mental health care uh, because that's a low, low volume, high, it's a high patient value, but it's not a highly reimbursed uh, fee for service issue. So I think we need to, we, there, there is going to be angst, uh, but I think there also needs to be a sense of possibility as well. So, and the possibility is that there will be a system emerge with community involvement. And I think you're hearing that strong and clear. There needs to be genuine community involvement. Uh, to actually move toward a system that we're not going to have the change that's, that we just, we can't control or that we can't uh, participate in creating. Uh, instead, we're gonna have a more, that we're gonna work toward change that will benefit uh, Vermonters uh, in the long run. And, and I think, I, I guess the other point I wanna make is that I think you're, I think there's a big job here to frankly uh, put forward why now, why, what, why is it what you're proposing? Uh, and so I think this is the this is the beginning. I see this as a part of the beginning of that process. But there's a lot more that needs to happen to bring stakeholders uh, to the table to be part of something uh, as significant as this. Uh, and and so I think there needs to be thought and planning about. We're just know. trying to 
to figure out a way to get the table to bring everybody to. Well, I, I understand. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes it's uh, which comes first, the table or the people wanting a table. So, uh, well, I'll leave it there. I, I, have a bunch, I, have, I have some other more specific questions and, you know, we'll find another way to take more time. Uh, I see that Representative Cordes and Representative Goldman have questions and then we'll see where we are. Uh, but I do want to respect uh, trying to end shortly after 1130, if not at 1130. Representative Goldman or Representative Cordes, I think. Thank you. I thank you all for your and I, uh, and I understand that and um, look forward to um, working together to create the significant change that um, we should be uh, shepherding instead of allowing to have happen to us. You're, Mar Mar you're, 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 you're breaking up quite a bit. Perhaps if you dropped your video, sometimes the audio works better without the video, even thank though we're not actually seeing you. Thank you. So um, understanding that, that um, I, I do look forward to working with you, uh, with all of us and the community um, moving forward to, sh to shepherd these um, very necessary changes. One area uh, I think of and have thought of, uh, one service um, have thought of often over the years is dialysis services. And I know that uh, CMS um, now has uses prospective. There's a recent, um, you still can't hear me? It's really breaking up. We hear every few words. But I hear you asking about dialysis. I think we're going to need to come back to you, Representative Cordes, because we're not hearing you at all at this point. Why don't we? Why don't we go to Representative Goldman? I think and, I oh, just, there you're back. You're back. Can you hear me now? I just switched to a different Wi-Fi system. Can you hear me better? Yes. Okay. So um, dialysis is challenging. CMS uses um, the Biden administration also looking at um, socioeconomic um, factors that impact equity. Um, I, my concern is that we continue to ensure that people that live in Vermont have access to dialysis services. They are some of the most vulnerable patients that shouldn't have to travel long distances three times a week to receive those services. Um, and I understand the, you know, hospitals often have to subsidize dialysis. I'm taking long pauses. Can you hear me? It's very difficult, <laughs> actually. Uh, I can, right. I can, I can hear you. And I think one of the things I would say is I so appreciate that comment that you just made. Um, and I think one of the goals here is to recognize that we're trying to move to a system that ensures access to essential services. Dialysis is essential service. And we need to have the system be designed so that people have access to it in close proximity when they need it. And so right now, the system, as it's designed, may or may not allow that access for certain communities. And so when we think more strategically and intentionally about what communities need, and we identify those voids, then we use the payment model and the design system that we're thinking about to ensure that those services are delivered to patients who need it. And particularly, this a lot of this exercise should be about a lot of focus should be on the most vulnerable communities who don't have often have a voice and may not have access to essential services. And we don't want to export any care that we can do within the state. I mean, that's the, the reality. Um, you know, if anything, we would want to import care because we have high quality uh, um, centers of excellence that are delivering care that people would seek out. So it could be economic development to bring people in and we based some of our um, NPR decisions in the past on the fact that, uh, for example, Southwestern was able to bring in people from um, New York and uh, Massachusetts because of the failure of some of the uh, systems that were in place in those communities. And we certainly uh, um, 
recognized that and uh, incorporated that into the the decisions because uh, um, any care that we can do in the state of Vermont should be done in the state of Vermont. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Thank you. I'm going to go to Representative Goldman, and then I think we'll stop for the. Even though I I know there are more questions, we're going to stop for the morning. Representative Goldman, you get the. Yeah, I, I want to thank you for all your work. It's really um, interesting and echo Representative Potent's excitement about what we can accomplish when we put our heads together, um, sort of starting legislatively and moving all the way down to the communities. Um, I think when we think about social determinants of health and Chair Mullen, you talked about prediabetes, I think we need to, that, I see that as midstream. The hospital system is downstream. It's the most downstream and most expensive part of our system. And moving as upstream as we can get is where we're gonna really keep people healthier. I think it's tragic that we're losing pediatric practices because that's where the most impact can happen. So I, you know, it just made me sad to hear that and wondering how we can do it. Um, we spend a lot of money at end of life care. There was an article that um, Representative Burroughs sent out about uh, by uh, Dr. Emmanuel, uh, Ezekiel Manuel about his father's experience at end of life. I think it would be an important conversation of how we do that and how we make it accessible in our communities. So that would be an interesting topic. I think for me, uh, as policymakers, what do you need from us to support the transformation work besides $5 million? I would say that we would need your advocacy so that uh, people can uh, um, see that this is a concerted effort by um, everyone in the state to um, try to make our health care system better. And so... Um, you know, bringing positivity to your own local communities and bringing information because Vermonters aren't following what we're talking about here today, um, but they might be listening to you when they run into you at the, the store or at a restaurant or so on. So um, that's what we really need from you is a full commitment that, um, you know, we're, we want to move away from um, past failures and move towards future successes. So and I would hope that you all would be involved in those community conversations that we have. Mm -hmm. When we do move out into the communities, it would be incredibly helpful to have you there um, with us, with the, you know, the group of individuals who are leading some of this effort to have you there at the table. Yeah, that's what I was gonna add. I come from the Springfield Hospital area and have been following that very closely. Um, another, you know, the culture versus capacity problem is huge there. Um, so how do we make that shift? I'm interested in doing what I can to participate and support it. Thank you. And I, I would add, I would add as well, Representative Goldman, uh, and I, I've said this on numbers of occasions that we get to talk about this, think about this in a greater depth than our colleagues who are busy thinking about natural resources or thinking about transportation and climate change policy or thinking about other issues. And so part of our, our role as well is once we've um, vetted this sufficiently and feel that there's a way forward that we can support and that we do support, then it's also important, it's imperative that we, uh, we are agents of interpretation and information to our colleagues uh, within our own legislature as well, because they, they're going to look to us to say, I hear, I hear the, these questions and those questions, what are you folks talking about? And I think that that's why I wanted to spend uh, some additional time because I feel like we have not had that yet that opportunity at the same level that I'd like us to. Uh, and this is, this, this is now putting in front of us uh, a, a proposal that's uh, very significant uh, and uh, it will be challenging, but very significant as well and an opportunity for us to, to continue to ask questions. So uh, along the way, we uh, just say, we may very well want to ask you to come back. We have, we have another whole set of questions to ask you uh, as we try to uh, get our heads around uh, what this really means and whether and how we can uh, be advocates for this. So I'm going to stop. Could I just ask a follow-up to you, actually, if I may? Uh, Leslie, no. very quick question for you. Yeah. I'm just curious, and I'm new, as you know, 
Um, do we on this kind of thing that's so big ever take a stand as a committee? It may not be a bill, but would we come together as a group and say, we want to support this? Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the places that will be in front of us in the near term is a budget request. Great. Seriously, okay. I mean, that, money is yeah, policy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank and, you. and frankly, that's part of why I pushed hard to have us do this jointly, because in fact, that budget request is, is going to be in front of us very quickly. And I was concerned that the budget request was ahead of the ability to actually understand what was underneath the budget request. Uh, and so that, 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 is, that, is a, that is an opportunity and not the only opportunity. Okay. So I'm going to uh, first let me let me thank Kevin. Thank thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, uh, Je Jessica. I'm going to use first names. I, of course, I, please do. Yes. I apologize, uh, Susan and Elena. This this I think this has been very valuable this morning. Uh, and uh, again, I think we have uh, we have, we have more we want to understand. But uh, and I want to say, if I may, in addition to the presentation, I think that uh, Jessica, the, the introduction that you gave. I found uh, very, very helpful. Uh, I, I texted with Jessica to check in with her and she's going to provide a copy of that, a transcribed copy of her introductory remarks, which I think summarizes, it brings together in a, in a very, very uh, positive and powerful way, uh, the case that is being made in the presentations as well and in the full study. But most, pe no, most people are not gonna be reading a 68 page study, uh, nor even a 30 plus or 40 page PowerPoint, but I think the summary that you put together, Jessica, as an introduction, I found very, very helpful, and uh, we will be posting that uh, on our web page and also making it available to committee members. Happy to. Thank, thank you all for taking the extra time. I know we flexed, uh, and we we it was last minute, but this I think has been an investment worth uh, worth making, and we will continue to. Uh, raise questions and uh, ask for your input.